When you look at Levi's, you look at Disney. These are companies that are seem to making decisions about wokeness. And I've always spoken in my own voice. I write all my own books. I write my own speeches. I write my own emails. It sounds stupid, but if you've been around corporate America, you know that executives rarely speak in their own voice. I want every trans woman, is that what we call the men who are women, it's trans women, right? To infiltrate the LPGA, the US Tennis Association, just win everything. If we are going to go down this road of the absolute clown show absurdity, let, let's do the whole thing. I would just say, let's just eliminate any sex. Let's see who gets to compete. States across the United States have rejected the cast review as, you know, who effing knows, it's ridiculous. Welcome to the Future's Edge. I am Jim Urio. That's Bob Iacchino. You guys who watch the show know that probably 60 to 70% of the shows we do are macroeconomic, trading, uh, finance shows. But we deviate on occasion when we have a good reason to. This is going to be one of those shows. I Today, I'm so excited. We have one of my personal heroes, and I'm not even joking. Jennifer Say, formerly of Levi's, author of the book Levi's Unbuttoned, owner, founder of the clothing brand, XXXY, which fights for women's rights. Thank you so much for being here. We truly appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Good. So can you do us a favor first? Because by the way, just to tell you quickly about Bobby and I, which I'm, I'm sure you probably know all about us because you're probably big fans of ours too. <laughs> but we both, <laughs> we both were part of mainstream media for quite a long time. Me for um, 15 years, which with, with what we like to call the TMZ of financial media. Oh. Toward the end of my stint there, they kept telling me, what I could and couldn't say, what I should and shouldn't say. And this is things about my macroeconomic policy, not about anything political. We don't have any interest in politics. We have lots of interest in policy. And finally, at the end of them, I said, we had a meeting and I said, you know, you guys can all go F yourself. I don't know how from, how uh, comfortable you are with swearing, but normally we are very comfortable with it. But at the end, of it, we did have a meeting and I said, I'm not saying my integrity isn't for sale. I'm saying you're two zeros too short. It was a joke that I thought was funny. They didn't that think it funny. was funny at all. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience? That's pretty funny. Yeah, I, uh, I'll i give you the cliff notes if I can. Um, as a child, I was an elite gymnast uh, in the 1980s. I made my first national team at, I think, 10 years old. I was training inordinate numbers of hours and crazy. It's a crazy, crazy sport. By the time I was nine or 10, you know, easily 30, 40 hours a week. Anyway, I became the 1986 national champion. I was a seven time national team member. I left the sport in 1988 with all of that success under my belt, just completely broken and falling apart because of the abusive uh, nature of the coaching and the culture. Uh, I dusted myself off and kept going. I went to Stanford, then I moved to San Francisco, and I started working in the fashion business, first at Gap, and then at Levi's, and I worked at Levi's for 23 years, climbed the corporate ladders, and that, the corporate ladder in the 90s um, and 2000s, and I became the chief marketing officer there and helped the company go public uh, in 2019, and then I became the brand president. I also, during that time, wrote a book called Chalked Up in 2008, which was uh, the very first first-person account of the abusive nature of the sport of gymnastics. That was very controversial. That was my first experience with being kind of canceled, albeit within a smaller kind of world of just sports and the Olympic movement. And I didn't really care what they thought of me anyway. In 2020, at the very beginning of COVID, I was opposed to school closures, playground closures, everything impacting children. I was kind of opposed to all of it, but I talked mostly about kids. Um, found myself kind of ousted by my community in San Francisco, um, by my friends, certain members of my family. I ended up leaving the city of San Francisco and ultimately resigning from my job at Levi's. And now here I am starting my own brand called XXXY Athletics, because you can't cancel someone who's been canceled twice. I think you're uncancelable at that point, so you might as well keep going. We launched about two months ago, and it's going really, really well. I think there's a demand. We're the only athletic brand that stands up for women, female athletes and women's sports. So it's so funny. I spent I spent the weekend at Stanford um, this last weekend. I was at the graduation and oh. uh, such a lovely campus, by the way, too. It is. And I really ha had a nice time, but I could 
feel a lot of the things that you're saying as well yeah. too. But the um, is yeah, is tough. I mean, I went back recently and was like, as much as I love it, and it's such a beautiful city, San Francisco, and gosh, I love the smell and so many memories there. But I cannot live amongst those people. Well, it's so funny because what I said to my daughter, Bobby, I'll give you the next question, but I have one daughter who's more conservative than I am, which is saying up. But my other daughter is an environmental scientist, just got her master's from Stanford. And she does, she starts to veer toward, you know, I, left. I don't even know what it means, but like some of the weird left. And I said today, oh, she, I was just talking to her and I said, oh, I'm having a, uh, you know, someone who I really respect a lot, a woman's rights advocate, Jennifer Say, but it didn't, I told her, you should look her up. But I'm thinking to myself, she might not see it the same way that we do, but I am 100% behind the women's advocacy angle of what you are doing, because I think it is just, it's just right, Bob. Yeah, I want, to, uh, I want to talk about the brand. So this is obviously one of the shirts, right? Free to think, free to speak. I have one on just There's launched today. The hoodie right there. Yeah, team um, women. Obviously, like, I sort of had two immediate connections with, not you specifically, but yes, you. Uh, number one was the Bruce Springsteen album cover with the Levi's that kind of like shocked everyone back into thinking, you know, the history of Levi's and what they were, what they meant to sort of American culture. Most of my family is still in Italy. My parents were immigrants and my cousins wanted Levi's. They, every time I came oh, to yeah. visit them, they said, bring us Levi's, bring us Levi's. And then the second thing being the mo the first time I ever seriously considered, this is going to sound shitty, but I don't mean it as shitty as it sounds. First time I ever considered women's sports as being important. Okay. It was 1995 with the Nike commercial, if you let me play sports. Do you guys remember that? Hell I, yeah. Jennifer probably does. Yeah. I was wildly affected by that commercial. As yeah. a matter of fact. You're not alone. Yeah. So as a matter of fact, my sister, um, I, I think she was pregnant with her first daughter. She has three daughters. And I remember making sure she saw that commercial and, and kind of giving her my take on it and all that stuff. And every one of her daughters has played soccer, basketball, volleyball, and they've all just turned into just amazing young women. The, the youngest one is still just an insane athlete. Like she's out of her mind. She jumps rope in between basketball games and soccer games to stay warm for her two practices or two games. Just wacko. I love her. In talking about the brand XXXY, what drove you rather than to try to go within another brand and develop something or even just take a job versus yeah. starting this and taking it in the direction that you're taking it, which yeah. I'm wildly impressed by? Yeah. First off, I just want to say I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. I don't think that's very cool to say anymore, but I'm a Jersey girl. I grew up in Jersey and Philadelphia area. And uh, yeah, that album. Uh, it was 1984, amazing. right? That, that yeah, it was so. born in the USA. Okay. Um, and it was a watershed moment for the brand, actually. So um, I graduated high school. But and what you describe about your relatives in Italy wanting Levi's, I'll tell a brief story and then I'll move on to your question. Uh, when I was uh, an elite gymnast in the 1980s, I went to the Goodwill Games, which I don't even think it exists anymore. But for those that don't know, it was this Ted Turner owned international competition. It was meant to sort of be like an Olympics level, Olympic style competition. It was a response to all the boycotts that were happening in the 80s. Because if you remember, the US boycotted the Olympics in Moscow in 1980. And then in 1984, the Russians boycotted when it was in LA. And he was like, sports should not be political. Everybody should come together and compete in the spirit of, you know, competition. Um, and so he created this thing called the Goodwill Games. And the very first one was in Moscow. And I was told, this is obviously before the wall came down. It was 1985. So I traveled to Moscow and I was told to bring 501s, Levi's 501s, and I'd be able to trade them with the Russian athletes because <laughs> they all wanted Levi's. They represented freedom. And that, I think, is still true on the world stage. Um, although, who knows if they do anymore. Anyway, if if <laughs> the U.S. does anymore is actually what I was, um, what I was trying to say. Okay, why did I start my own? You know, I I was joking about being uncancelable, but it it I'm not joking about the fact that I've been canceled, and I am sort of um, persona non grata, I guess you could say, within corporate America. And as I was interviewing for jobs for the last year and a half, well, starting way back, right after I decided to resign from Levi's, I was being grilled with questions about basically 
this dance I had taken around COVID and I was being um, asked if I would apologize and did I regret my actions and was I sorry for what I'd done as if I'd done this terrible thing when in reality at this point I think it's very clear I was correct um, that closed schools were both ineffective and very, very harmful. Yeah. Um, even the New York Times reports <laughs> reports as such right now. But if you say it too early, you say it too soon before the New York Times says you're allowed to say it, then you are a very terrible, horrible person. Um, and the general sort of vibe in the air is, yes, uh, closed schools were bad, but the people who advocated for open schools are worse. So even though they were right, they're still wrong, very bad people. And the people who <laughs> said schools need to stay closed were incorrect, but they did it for the right reason. So we need to give them amnesty. It and makes you amnesty. dizzy when you think about it. <laughs> I know, but that's a pretty good description if you think yes. about it. So as I was interviewing for lar big jobs, you know, CEO jobs at very large, you know, many billions of dollars, uh, companies, it became very clear to me that I would have to sell my soul and I would have to apologize for something that I had done that wasn't wrong, that I would have to sort of sign away my right to speak as a citizen and as a person. And I've always spoken in my own voice. I write all my own books. I write my own speeches. I write my own emails. It sounds stupid, but if you've been around corporate America, you know that executives rarely speak in their own voice. And it's interesting because as I interviewed the folks that were, you know, the functions within corporate America that were most critical of me were HR and then sort of corporate communications, which I think are two functions that should have very little power in an organization Amen. <laughs> um, and have way too much right now. Um, you know, HR used to do recruiting and benefits. And now they tell the CEO what to say in every single company. And they spend lots of employees time doing useless trainings that don't drive revenue or add any, you know, EBIT to the bottom line. And I joke, but I'm not joking that I will go as long as is humanly possible, hopefully forever without having a typical HR um, division. I have no one in HR right now in my company. I will hire recruiters when I need to recruit. I'll hire benefits experts when I need to offer benefits. That is it. No HR person will tell me I have to do X number of trainings um, and take up employees' time and take away their attention from actually driving the business. So as I went through that process, I was like, yeah, I can't do it. I'm too old for this. I'm not going to do that. And while I never wanted to be in the startup world, I liked working in established brands with established companies, with infrastructure. I had this idea with a friend that this brand could be really powerful and that I would perhaps be the only person that could do it, given my background in both fashion and elite sports and my willingness to say things that make people angry and then not care that they're angry with me. <laughs> so I was like, let's roll the dice. Let's try it. So I'm having a blast. It's only two months. You know, we're very young. So, so for the people who are watching, by the way, make no mistake about this. We are, we have Jennifer on because we are trying to sell her product. We believe in the company. So please guys look into it. High quality stuff. Bobby's got the shirt on. You guys will all look way better than this, Bobby before does. Before you go on, Jimmy, this is yeah. not a sponsored episode. It's not sponsored. We just like what she's she doing. I have enough money. This shirt. Yeah, right. <laughs> Someday you will, and then we'll come to you. <laughs> After we get a bunch, we drive a bunch of people to buy your product, well, then we'll come to you for sponsorship. Hmm. That sounds good. That sounds good. On that note, though, I do just want to say this is not a gimmick. I am not out here, you know, rage baiting or whatever people say to make money and get clicks and all that garbage. This is very high quality product, as you two both have attested to. Um, we have a real designer. <laughs> we have the highest quality fabrics you can find in the market. Look, I learned from the best at Levi's. That's incredibly high quality denim, the best jeans in the world, I think. I still wear them. I'm wearing actually white 501s right now. I have no interest in doing something that's a gimmick. And I, I think, you know, there's a lot of brands right now. There's a lot of talk about this quote unquote parallel economy. And You've probably heard about it. I take issue with it. I think I don't, I'm, this is not a parallel economy brand. This is a regular brand. And we aim to compete with Lulu and Nike and the very best brands in the world. We're not out to make some gimmicky product um, that just has a slick, you know, tagline. This is real product that I, I think is, is world-class. So I, you know, I think that's important to know because there are some gimmicky things out there. Yeah. So I, I want to point out two quick things before Jimmy throws in a real question. Number one, I, I have two of your t-shirts. 
And this is one of them, obviously. I love the slogan on it. But look at this neck, okay? This is an underappreciated, I don't even know what you call it. It's an underappreciated feature in T-shirts now, in crew neck T-shirts now. This sort of like, I don't know what you call this lip thing here, Jennifer. It's like- Well, it's, it's a crew neck and there's a wider band, so it doesn't stretch yeah. out. But it's not too tight because men no, don't like it too tight on the neck. Like, so. It's not smooth with the shirt. There's a lip here, which is like, it's really solid. It stays on a hanger. It doesn't stretch That's out true. when you hang it up, which I'm a psycho. All I wear is t-shirts and I hang them by color on the same type of hanger. Mm -hmm all the way across. What kind of lunatic hangs their t-shirts? It stretches out the neck. My wife it's hangs mine and it almost causes a divorce. It what? doesn't on this shirt. Not on that shirt. Kind of okay. Good. It doesn't stretch out. It's very high quality cotton. It's Peruvian cotton, which is the best cotton in the world. Cool. Um, it's very soft. I think yeah, it's a it really good fit, hopefully. But you um, agree that I should divorce my wife if she hangs any more t-shirts of mine on a, on a hanger or no? I Are you against say you should divorce that? her if she buys any other t-shirts. Here's the second thing okay, I want to say. I also have the solid black one, which has the, the logo down on, I think it's the right hand side down on the bottom. And all I wear is t-shirts. I live in Southwest Florida. We, if we go somewhere fancy, I put a sport coat over a t-shirt. My friends joke now when I wear your black crew neck that I've pulled out my good shirt. So it must be, <laughs> we must be going somewhere fancy. fancy. Because some of my other t-shirts are so cheap, but that's all I wanted to point out. And again, okay. I bought the t-shirts. Jennifer's not sponsoring this episode. So this not is sponsoring the show, buy the t-shirts. Now here's my question though. And this is something that's a serious question and something that terrifies me quite a bit. Okay, when you look at Levi's, you look at Disney, you look at Target, you look at Anheuser-Busch. These are companies that are seem to making to be making decisions about wokeness or whatever the hell you want to call it, that come into conflict with their share price with it, it seems like they're trying to curry favor more with the government than they are trying to curry favor with the people who buy their product do you think that that's a concern and is this is this just a, a amplification of corporatism that's this creep that's happening I don't think it's currying favor with the government, although I could be wrong. I, you know, I think having many friends on the corporate side of things still who are in, you know, boardrooms and executive team rooms across the country, I would say it's more that they live, you know, most of these companies are in on the coasts, California, New York, not all, but even when they are not on the coast, these are folks that live very much in a bubble, a political bubble. And for whatever reason, and you know, the left is now the purview of uh, the wokest elites imaginable. Um, it didn't used to be that way. I don't mean the left. I mean, corporate executives and boardrooms are filled with very woke elites. And it used to be sort of accepted that business leaders were sort of more right leaning. That is not the case anymore. And if you look at, for instance, as one metric, political donations from some of the top companies in the world, from individuals, not the companies, because a lot of companies don't actually, it depends, but many companies, I mean, we didn't at Levi's, you know, give to candidates. But if you look at the donations, top tech companies, you know, in Silicon Valley, it's like 96% to Democratic candidate. There's no thought diversity within these companies. There is no thought diversity within their communities and the people they hang out with. So they just think this is what everybody thinks. And so I think they convince themselves it's the right thing to do and that they're activists. But really, they think it's a money-making strategy. Because sure, I hope so. They think yeah. everybody thinks this, but that's where they're wrong. And they think only the craziest, most lunatic people have views that differ and they've never met any of these people. So they're e able to kind of put them in this kind of, you're a lunatic box. It's half the country that doesn't agree. And it's, you know, half the country that are not lunatics. They just have different views. So I think it's less current favor with government and more current favor with their friends. And it enables them to feel like good people even though they've chosen careers which they would not be able to justify because, you know, it used to be greed was good. And again, right leaning corporate executives. Now they are lefties who pretend that they are saving the world. So they get to be both rich and world saving, but they don't want to admit to themselves and certainly not to the, the, the quote unquote fans of the brand that this is in fact a money-making marketing strategy. And that is, to me, what is at the heart of woke capitalism. I should also say their children influence them. Okay. Their children are largely 
you know, woke and they're going to these very woke, um, pro fancy private academies and then private colleges, places like Columbia and Harvard. And we know what's happening there right now. We live in the era of I'm your friend, not your parent. They want their kids to like them and be proud of them. And their kids want to like their parents for their advocacy, but they also want all the money that comes, you know, from a job that is not in any sort of political advocacy. So it's all very complicated, but I think they lie to themselves as much as anything. I don't think they see it this way, but the hypocrisy is, is everywhere. So, so uh, just to add on that real quick before I ask the next question is that when, I don't know if you heard about the Stanford graduation, probably maybe almost as many as 20% of the students got up and walked out in solidarity with Palestine or whatever it was. I, I mean, and what I was, I was actually really impressed with the crowd didn't pay him any mind. Nobody even discussed it. I went to a party later that day with, you know, 30 graduates and their families. Nobody said a word about it. I love that, by the way. If my daughter, I would have, I'd have her tracked on Locate Locator, which I, it's, it's weird, I know, but I still have her on Locator. And I'm like, God damn it, if she walks out, because if I was in college and I was sitting in an 85 degree California sun and somebody got out to walk out of it like, wait, what are we protesting? I'm out here with you too, because I'll go to the bar. Yeah. But if she did, I was going to strangle it. I don't know what's going on with the college kids today. My husband and I were just talking about it the other day. If somebody, when I was in college, had said to me, you cannot leave your dorm room. You cannot, you have to wear this mask all the time. You can't have any parties. I mean, and I come from the opposite side of the political spectrum. I've been a lefty. I'm not anymore. I don't know what I am anymore. But college is when you're supposed to rebel and not do what people tell you. There's no way in hell I right. would have agreed to, to, to that. To try to keep me or Bobby, young college boys, away from young college girls the whole time. That from just a would party? Never, Are you would kidding? never have happened. Yeah, we would. I would have joked about it. Like, oh, yeah, sure. You're locked down. I'm all in. <laughs> I'll see you. And then I'm gone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to go to, to something else because you mentioned something before. You said 50% of the population. I actually think it's more than 50% of the population who's against a lot of the woke bullshit that's going on too. But I'll pick up oh, one yeah. thing. I was just going. Republican no, I, I know exactly yeah. what you're doing, but I, this is just yeah. amusing as a segue. I think yeah. it's a, I think it's a media technique. I've had no formal training. So yeah. Don't try to know. But now on to, yeah. on to, um, you don't, need it. <laughs> you don't need it. I don't think on to, um, biological men, playing in okay. women's sports. Now, here's my theory on this, and I want you to elaborate on that. I don't think, you know, because it pulls out at like 85% of people disagree with it in general. I think that's close to 100%. I think even the people who are pushing it don't agree with it. I think that the movement, when it, when it can't find something that people go crazy about, it just has to keep looking for the more absurd. And I think we're in this absurd clown world where I don't even think the advocates of the policy believe in it themselves. What am I missing? What am I getting wrong? I actually think probably five to 10% of the population are true believers and have literally like imbibed the bullshit. I like cursing just fine. They have really kind of taken this idea of trans women are women and they believe it in every fiber of their being. But I think that's true with any kind of movement or I don't, you know, any, like I think during COVID, it was probably higher to start 20%. But I think most people just go along. Yeah. Most so, people just go along. Okay. So I agree with you. I do think there are a percentage that believe that it's true and that trans women are women and they should be able to compete against women and they have no unfair advantage. Now, whether or not they've been brainwashed or not, I, you know, I can't say, but they believe it. So and I think the number I mean, the numbers range in the in the surveys, you know, the most common number I hear cited is 70% of the population agrees with us. I agree with you. I think it's higher than that. I think some people are afraid to even say it in an anonymous survey because you get, I have, ne I mean, I have been attacked. I was attacked during COVID in ways you cannot imagine. It's almost not anything compared to what I'm getting now. Yeah. So what, Bobby, a quick one, then I'll throw it to you. Just a yeah, quick story too. And this, I was talking some, I still have some friends who are somewhat leftist and we were talking about, I think the name of the actress was Ellen Page, right? She was in the movie about the dreams, whatever too. So I said, and we're at a dinner party. I said, so I'm, I'm going to, there's, here's the calculus here. And you tell me if, if you agree, I said, so she is a cute, somewhat sexy young girl, probably a little too young for me. So now today she says she is a man and you guys say now she is a man. Well, I'm still you know, attracted her. I still think she's cute. So factually, that makes me gay. That's what all you guys are saying. Like, I am I am gay, and I get all the accolades that go with that. I can get into better schools and shit. And they're all looking at me like this, like, but you're not gay. No, no, I'm going by your rules here, just so you know. But anyway, that's just, I thought it was funny because they were all looking at me like I was crazy. Bobby? 
Yeah, Jennifer, I want to ask you about um, the brand of your clothing line. So you said this is a high quality brand, high quality line to compete with Nike. And I applaud you, especially for the Nike one, because uh, that I, I can't wait till you start making shoes at some point down the road because I, I just am yeah. done with them. But from a perspective of the name of the brand, can we go into that? Because you said you it was an idea you and a friend had, and you know your your website says, "Correct me if I'm quoting it wrong." We stand up for women and this brand and all that. And, um, there, I can attest to the quality. It's not like you're charging a hundred dollars for a T-shirt. They're like this was like fifty five dollars, I think fifty dollars somewhere in that range. Forty. So it's value, it's quality. <laughs> Tell me about the name of it. Yeah. So it's called XXXY Athletics, and it's you know, refers to the chromosomes. XX is female, XY is male. That is true. It is meant to sort of express a truth. I hate that I have you to know, laugh at that. because The, it's the brand is ultimately thing. really all about speaking truth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are going to say, they're going to come at me and they're going to say, oh, but there's other chromosomal combinations. Those are chromosomal abnormalities. Of course. That's what they, that, that is. Yeah. They're, Th those are abnormalities. They're about 0.1 if less per than that percentage of the population. And I will tell you, I have quite a few mom friends. Well, they're friends now, but they've, they've written me on the subject and they have children with these chromosomal abnormalities. There are, there's a wide range of them. I'm not going to get into it. They seriously resent and are very angered by the fact that this movement, the LGBTQ movement, who's advocating for trans women are women and should be able to come into women's locker rooms and sports, they resent their children being used in this way to say, you know, my child who has this genetic abnormality is not yours to use to fight your political battles. My child does not mean that sex is a spectrum. Sex is binary. It is binary. That is not actually defined by the chromosomes. It's defined by the gametes. I'm not a, a, an evolutionary biologist, but I know this. The gametes being women have eggs, men have sperm. There is no other thing that anyone has, even if they have some different chromosomal makeup. They don't have some different gamete. Those are the two. That is what makes sex binary. This is not something we ever had to discuss or argue about up until about five minutes ago. Suddenly we do. And it's it's crazy. So that that's what the name is. You know, it also looks cool. The logo looks cool. You know, not to kind of overthink it too much, but I think it's a great it's a great logo. That's what it stands for. The chromosomes, male and female chromosomes, which is true. True. Yeah. So the reason the reason I wanted to get into that is because I I think the logo is spectacular. I remember the first time I saw it, you uh, have my friend Adam Coleman on your website, who is clearly a man, and he's an incredible man. He's a very masculine man, but he is not violent. He's very soft-spoken. It's not about these sort of extremes on either side. And you especially, I think that's especially defined when it comes to athletics. I told you before we started the show that my wife is a better athlete than me, and it is... It, just permanently annoying to me and it's something that's in my face every single day jimmy knows her and when i when i look at this brand and i think to myself this is exactly what i would want to be wearing because it, in terms of sports it's exactly true and this is sportswear right? right so again from a perspective of the brand itself people are saying to you that it's political i'm sure right oh you're doing this to attract the conservatives but you are a, you know, a self-professed former leftist or left liberal, let's call it liberal for lack of it. Cause yeah. I don't even like leftist. It just sounds weird. Yeah. Abnormal is not a bad word. Like Jimmy is abnormally handsome, for example. Right. No doubt about it. Yeah, right. That's just a that fact. I have no time for normal people. They're very boring. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so what kind of blowback are you getting when you say, look, this is not political because people yeah. on the left think this and people on the right think this. Yeah. What's the type of blowback you get for the name of the brand? Um, well, it's for the brand's message, which is we are the only athletic brand to stand up for women's sports and women's spaces. We believe women deserve a quality of opportunity, fairness, privacy, and safety. And allowing males to compete in women's sports invades our privacy. Um, it makes our sports less safe and it doesn't allow us to compete and win on an even playing field. So this makes people angry. 
Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the typical trolling on social media, which I ignore for the most part, it's been happening for many, many years now about other subjects, but I actually get voicemails now, which is creepy um, because apparently apparently my phone number is pretty easy to find, which is fine. I've just never been that careful, you know, so the voicemails are a little creepy, sometimes like five, six in a row from some kooky person. You know, I get texts, people, I don't know, people have my phone number and some of them are sort of They're careful to walk a line, but they are kind of threatening. I don't worry about it too much. Uh, I I don't actually worry. In fact, I often I often laugh. But of course, you know, the rhetoric is you're anti trans. You want trans people to die. You don't want trans people to exist. You're committing trans genocide. It's like just this like overblown, ridiculous language. I can't even take these people seriously anymore. And it's similar to what happened to me and to many during COVID, because if you push back on COVID policy, you were um, a racist, a eugenicist. You, go ahead, ask me what's racist about it. Opening schools meant you wanted black children to die. That's right. what that meant. It was the dumbest thing on earth. When in fact, the structurally racist policy was keeping the public schools closed. Of, of course it was. Were, yeah. were open. Yeah. The names don't bother me anymore. And I, there's a coalition. I've been doing this tour across the country where we do these rallies in, in towns across the country. And we have the broadest coalition of women advocating for keeping women's sports female, ideologically and politically diverse. There's hardcore, super left feminists who fought for women's safe spaces, you know, for decades now already. And then we have right-leaning folks. And then we have people like me who kind of don't fit anywhere and have decided to just be independents. This is, and the reason I say it shouldn't be political is because truth should not be political. And as far as I know, there is no scientist that has proven in some study that Sex is not binary. This is just something that magically appeared because the activist said so. No doubt about no, it. But didn't no we go? <laughs> didn't we go through this? You remember it had to be about 20, 25 years ago, where it was the weirdest thing. Barbara Walters was interviewing the first man to have a baby, but the problem that. with the whole thing was it's like some woman who had kind of looked like a painted-on mustache. Do you remember all this or no? It was the oh, most. This absurd. I don't remember. <laughs> okay, look it up. Barbara <laughs> Walters interviewed this. It was on Time Magazine. Oh, it was it was the most ridiculous thing she ever. She was busy, way- Jimmy. You and I were busy getting off work at three thirty and going to watch TV. <laughs> So we, so John McEnroe, I remember, I don't know, five years ago when he, which by the way, I coached high-end women's basketball for 12 years. I switched from men's uh, to women. I coached basketball for probably a total of 30 years. Huge fan of women's basketball. I don't particularly watch it because I watch basketball to, because it's a, for athletic feats. I watch girls yeah. softball all the time. I love watching college softball. I think it's, you know, it's a different game. It's not competing with the men. But remember when John McEnroe made the comment, like that Serena Williams couldn't even couldn't beat the 500th best player in the men's tour. And I remember hearing him say it and thinking, that's asinine to even say, because one, why are we comparing him? And two, you could go down, you know, many thousands further than that. Like, um, it, it's not, it's a biological, it's an enormous biological difference. So, yeah. like, why why would we ever try to, to compare him? I hate when they say things like, well, well, Serena Williams, when she says, someone says she's the greatest women's basketball player, ever, I mean, uh, tennis player ever, and someone will say, well, isn't she the greatest player? No, she's not the greatest player ever. Why are you doing this? And so here's what I, my question to you, since I've twice heard you say that we want to stand up for, for um, women's sports. Why? Because when I say, when I explain who you are, I try to bait the lefties because I'm kind of a dick sometimes with, no, she's a woman's rights advocate. Just make it broad and let them come at us and then we'll punch the shit out of them when they try to debate it. Do you do that on purpose? Do you choose your words because you want it to be narrow? I'm purposeful with my language, but I, you know what I tell people, because I have a lot of people come to me and they say, I totally agree with you, except they whisper it because they're afraid to say it out loud. But you know, what, what do I say when they say this? What do, they, what do I say when they tell me I'm anti-trans and I want all trans people to die? I just flip it. You know what? It is compassionate to stand up for women and girls. Women and girls are yeah. 51% of the population. We have fought for our rights and equality of opportunity for too long to give up on this. And women's bodies are different. We are not as fast and as strong. If you eliminated Title IX, which it has essentially been eliminated, and I'll talk about that in a second, women would make no teams and win no medals. You're totally right. Um, Serena and Venus Williams both lost in 6-1, 6-2 to the 203rd ranked men's player. I don't know how many years ago it was. Yeah. Um, they didn't even come close. 2003. Uh, 
Yeah. Alice, Alison Felix, who is, I think, was the fastest woman up in the world up until, you know, a, a couple of years ago, more Olympic medals, more, more, more world champion uh, medals. The year that she, I think in 2018, when she won world championships, she would have lost to 1500 males and boys. That's high school boys would have beat her time. High school average know nothing like not like exceptional what 1500 boys would have beat the fastest women woman most decorated female track athlete in the world like it's ridiculous yeah. so i just say it's compassionate to stand up for women and girls sure. um and there's this solution we can find a solution i don't want to leave anyone out i don't want to isolate anyone but they don't want the solution because the solution is to have an open category where everybody can compete or to have a special designated category like we do for weight class and age and all sorts of things. You could have a designated category, but they don't want that. They've rejected that. We do have open divisions. I mean, they're college, um, you know, football, college men's, men's basketball, whatever. They'd love, I mean, there's been what, 10 to 12 uh, women who've played division one college football, all in the same position, obviously. But I think those are open divisions. So compete in your open division. That's the only thing mm -hmm. I was gonna add to that. Yeah. most men's categories are open division. The NAIA, which is the college governing body for sort of clubs and intramural sports at the college level, and I think some D division three, they just made the sort of definitive declaration that the women's category in NAIA sports is for females only, born female only. No like weird rules and intricacies like, well, if you've been on hormones for that, no. Born female, you compete in the female category. The men's is open. Anyone can compete in it. But you know, the, the fact is, and there was a quote, and I'm not going to get it right recently, in, you know, in the last few days, Leah Thomas, formerly Will Thomas, the swimmer at the University of Pennsylvania, who kind of brought this issue to the forefront in 2022 in the NCAA swimming finals, he had sued the IOC, I think, to be allowed to compete at the Olympics this summer. The International Swimming Swimming Governing Body, so not even the IOC, his foray was rejected. He said something recently about, you know, how anti-trans this is and he's not, he's being banned from sport. He's not being banned from sport. He can compete in the men's category. And, and world swimming created even an open category for, or a trans category, he doesn't want that. He wants to compete against women so that he can win and it can validate his identity. Well, you know what? Women's sports are not here to validate your identity. <laughs> Okay, tell me, am I an asshole for this? And, and I want you to know where I'm going because over the last couple of years, I've been very public about, I want every trans woman, is that what we call the men who are women, is trans women, right? To, to infiltrate the LPGA, the US Tennis Association, just win everything. If we are going to go down this road of the absolute clown show absurdity, let, let's do the whole thing. Let's see who watches a bunch of um, men, you know, uh, dressed as women playing against women in tennis. I mean, it, the whole thing is stupid. It, do you think I'm just being hyperbolic? I probably am. No, I, you, I, no I, I would go you one further and I would just say, let's just eliminate any sex based. Yeah, how about that? Right. Just get yeah. rid of it. Let's see who gets to compete. I, have but, had a, I think one of the one of the biggest things about it is you very rarely, if ever, I don't know of any case where you see it going the other way, where trans no, you men don't. Ju go into a men's sport. No, they compete, compete in the women's the actual biological males. You never yeah. see that. that, that oh, no, there's a trans man me. boxer, uh, a trans man boxer competing in the women's category in the Olympics. And yeah. there was an article Four about MMA it, like, like a thing. transgender is competing in women. I'm like, oh, is it MMA? I'm like, what the hell are you people talking about? It's a, a woman yeah. who now identifies as a man, but she's competing with women. We're perfectly fine with that. Well, we, we, we respect all that. That doesn't compete. blow up the sanctity of the women's sports, which is compete what we are in the involved in. Yes, yeah, right. compete There's in the category than, to which you are born. Example. Yeah. There's more than yeah. one example of, of people who begin their transition to male, but stay in the women's category in sports. My, my only issue there which I assume they've sort of solved for in the instance that you're citing is the hormones. Mm -hmm. As far as I understand, athletes are still tested for steroids and blood doping. And so why, why should that be okay if it's prescribed by a doctor? So I, here's, I have a quick question though. So, cause one time I did argue this, uh, the sports sanctity with my daughter who used to lean more leftist, but she's like the instances of these, these people, it's all high profile, but it's very, very small. 
But I don't care, by the way. I don't care if it was 20. You're still knocking out girls who competed hard, who trained hard, who trained hard for a specific reason that you deprive them of. But is it broader? Like, do you have any any statistics on where we're seeing this and yeah. what high school sports, anything like that? Well, I will tell you, in the last couple of years alone, there are 600 instances, and it climbs every day, of males competing in women's sports and winning medals, team births, uh, scholarship dollars, injuring other you know, right. women who are competing. There's over 600, and that's accelerating by the day. It's accelerating every day. So it's going to keep happening. That, to me, is not a small number. I would argue one is too many. I don't understand. It, there's been a, a few very serious injuries. Why, why isn't one injury enough? I tell the story when I was at World Championships in 1985 in Montreal, I broke my femur on the podium. Oh, they changed the rules two days later that a coach was now going to be allowed up to just sort of tap you in case you fell wrong so that you might fall and not get a good score, but you wouldn't have this life altering injury. What, there have been serious injuries. Peyton McNabb, a volleyball player whom I know, serious concussion brain bleed. She's still two years later suffering from cognitive issues. She, can, yeah. she can't compete in softball, which she would have probably gotten a division one scholarship for. She struggles in school. Like that's a serious injury. Why, one injury is too many. It's not, it's not fair. And sports are dangerous. So you're already dealing with a certain degree of d danger and injury that is inevitable. Like we should protect women and girls from unnecessary physical injury. So there's 600. That being said, Every female that competes in women's sports is affected by this. So don't give me that it's too small of a number. It's every single, and I think 40% of girls now compete in high school sports. So that's a pretty big freaking number. Yeah. And the last thing I would say on this matter is, this is about fighting for the truth. Because the lie that sits underneath of this is that men and women are no different. Male and female bodies are the same. Sex is fluid. If you're a girl, you can become a boy. And if you're a boy, you can become a girl. And your sex is what you say it is. That is a lie. It is the most fundamental, egregious lie I can imagine. There's nothing more fundamental to our understanding of humanity than there are males and there are females. So I feel like this is about fighting for truth. I want to ask you, actually, I want to ask you both, Jimmy, because you have daughters. Um, were both your daughters athletes, Jimmy? Yes. One was a great athlete. One was not. So she knows that, by the way. This would not come as any surprise to her. <laughs> <laughs> she still deserves an even playing field. <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah. yeah. 1972, we got Title IX, right? And Title IX seems to be both under assault by certain states and being supported by certain states. And it, this is only, I mean, it's federal law, right? So the states can't change it. Yeah. But they can pass laws considering the way to enforce it and what it includes and what it doesn't include, things like that. And it's, it's interesting to me that 20 states have passed what those states call a more inclusive version of the enforcement of Title IX, which basically is, is lawyer talk for, we're gonna let trans kids compete in the sport they identify which, which we've already pointed out is only male to female. It's never the other way around. And then 20 states have done the opposite. States like Texas and Idaho, Oklahoma. they have passed Oklahoma. They have passed laws that do not let transgender people compete. They have to compete with their biological sex. I feel like people like you, Jennifer and Riley Gaines and others have are the only reason those other 20 states went this way, obviously, other than Texas and Idaho and Oklahoma, which is always going to go that way, right? Do you feel it's shifting? I mean, I think we all agree that it is a much larger percentage of people that think this entire conversation is borders on ridiculous. And, but yet corporations still seem to think it's the way to sell goods. And that's part of the reason I want people to buy your stuff. Not just yeah. the value and the right. quality, but for this exact reason. Yeah. Do you think the tide's turning or is it not turning? I do think it's turning, but I think we're a long way away. Mm -hmm. European countries have pulled back significantly to the point of having made it essentially not allowed anymore, this sort of gender affirming care for youth. So in the UK, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, these countries no longer um, are allowed to prescribe puberty blockers to young children, cross sex hormones, or perform surgeries because of something called the CAST review, which was a study um, by a pediatrician in the UK, which basically found there is zero evidence that any of that 
helps ease any of the symptoms, you know, the gender dysphoria. That, That's because so they're we, in their head. They could have just asked us. I'm sorry, but anyway. There's other me, issues. Huh? I know. I'm 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 not I'm trying not to stray beyond what the report actually no. says. <laughs> so right. I think we're very far away from that. In fact, you know, states across the United States have rejected the cast review as, you know, who effing knows? It's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the Title IX rewrite, which was issued in April by the Biden administration's Department of Education, they basically smuggled in all these changes and replaced sex-based rights with those of gender identity. So basically, to you know, to use your words, it's just a fancy way of, of saying men can now compete in women's sports. And all of these states and schools risk losing federal funding if they go against it. But it's really heartening because a lot have said, yeah, F you, we're not doing this. This isn't right. And we'll see what happens. I mean, if half the states do it, are they all going to lose their federal funding? This this is far from over. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think so. You know, yeah, a lot of states, Arkansas, Oklahoma, some that were sort of firmly red to begin with, but others that are a little bit more tweeners are standing up because I think at the end of the day, it's so ludicrous and we all know it's ludicrous and we all know the truth is that sex is binary. And so the truth will out in the end, but I think it's a long fight ahead. I really do. I think we're very far away. Well, this definitely feels to me like some somewhere where they, they done effed up, if I could use that <laughs> phrase, because literally it's one of those things. This is what I, I want your brand to not just succeed. I want it to freaking explode because this is not you know, the two-tiered economy that we talk about, red state, blue state economy, this is not a, a red or yeah. a blue thing. This is where they basically, I'm sorry, they fucked with moms. And anybody who's ever fucked with a mom knows you should not fuck with a mom. I mean, you just don't. I was wondering yeah. when we we have such respect for Jennifer. I thought we wouldn't say the F word, but I was wondering when oh. it was going to break. Normally we I say it all the time, but anyway, I go on. I say it a lot. Yeah, I, Jersey girl <laughs> no, deep I mean, down. That's, so. that's, this is why, again, they don't have up because, you know, you, you took this situation where maybe you were winning in certain circles over certain issues like COVID, for example, and lockdowns and things. But the minute you start screwing, you just start messing with what a mom cares about the most. I saw your thing on Prager U. You walked away from a million dollars, I would say, for your kids, not for any other reason. You know, your severance. My thing is kids. This is the thing. And when I spoke out about gymnastics and abuse in gymnastics, it was because I didn't want any other children to have to go through what I did. You know, I was 40 years old and I was very successful. I had two children. I was a vice president already at Levi's and I suffered from depression and anxiety. And I hate using PTSD, but when you're waking up with nightmares in the middle of the night persistently because of things that happened 25 years ago, I, you know, I don't know what else you call it. You know, I was made to train on a broken ankle for two years, humiliated, fat shape. So I just, I, I got to the point where I couldn't have other children go through that. You know, I had to do what I could do. And it was the same during COVID. And I, I say, I look at people all the time and they, you know, they ask me, you know, why is this the hill you were willing to die on X, Y, or Z? And I say, why weren't you? If you aren't willing to stand up for children and free speech, then I would argue you have no freaking hill and you have no principles. And I am about principle, not party. And so if that means that everybody, you know, my entire community, and I would have called myself the left of left of, I would have called myself left of left of center. I wasn't about to parrot the garbage they were telling me I had to parrot to be in good standing with the party. I don't need those. I don't need friends that bad. Oh. I honestly do not. Can you tell me more about any thoughts you might have on the Title Nine Nine thing? Because I don't have kids, so it doesn't really. Yeah. Matter. So what what happened in April was the Department of Education smuggled in basically, I would say, a very significant rewrite to Title Nine. It's it's it, that erases its original intention. It replaces sex based rights, which was the purpose of Title Nine: sex based rights, protecting women and girls' sex based rights within the education system. And it, it's not just in sports. That's the best known aspect of it, but it used to be like girls couldn't major, w young women couldn't have certain majors in college because they weren't sort of <laughs> feminine. <laughs> like there were all sorts of things within the education system that were sexist. So that was all done away with. And it's had a remarkable impact. Girls and women compete in sports, 40, 50% of them in, you know, in, in high school and in college, which has remarkable benefits, which were iterated in that Nike ad you were referring to earlier, L with less likely to be depressed, better body image, more likely to graduate high school, better grades in high school, less likely to get pregnant, all these things, like the benefits of participation in sports are amazing. So the Biden administration smuggles in this rewrite, which replaces sex-based rights with gender identity. 
which basically means a male who declares that he is female can come into women's locker rooms, women's clubs like sororities, uh, women's sports. And if the university or other women in those on those teams and blogger rooms and sororities say no, they will be charged with sexual harassment. If and when they are charged with sexual harassment, there will be no due process, which is another problem with this whole thing. And even the ACLU saw fit to weigh in on that. It, it'll just be some person deciding that you you know, harassed a person because you misgendered them or something and you would be kicked out of school. So this is the rewrite. I think it starts in August of this year. Um, lots of states are pushing back. It's the end of Title IX, in my opinion, because it completely erases the original intention. Tell the people where they can find you and where they can buy your clothes real quick before we get you out. Yeah, xx-xy athletics, or an easy way to remember it is thetruthfits.com. That's it. My own website is sayeverything.com and you can get to the brand from there too. That's it. <laughs> I love that. And guys, remember, I close the show out with this all the time, even when we're talking with an economist, is that one of the reasons Bobby and I left mainstream media, I hate that cliche, is that there they tell you what to say, what you can and can't, and it's it's pressure from the sponsors. We want to start our own thing where even if you think our opinions are bullshit, you know that there are honest to God opinions. That's why we have Jennifer on the show, because she's the same way as we are at a much grander scale. And I hope she keeps fighting until their last punch is thrown. Do you have any last words or can your queens play out? <laughs> Me? I got nothing. You got nothing. Okay, thank you guys for joining us. We appreciate it very much.